Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Ryan, and I serve as the Executive Vice President at Herrera Health Group. We are proud to be supporting the ACES AWARE initiative on behalf of the California Office of the Surgeon General and the Department of Healthcare Services. This webinar is part of a new series designed to take an in-depth look at research on the science of adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. In our first segment, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris presented information that serves as the foundation for all of the work that we are doing through the ACES AWARE initiative. As she said, in order to be successful, the initiative must be deeply rooted in the science and based on evidence that has been firmly established through research. As always, we want to thank those of you who submitted questions in advance. Several of those questions will be covered during today's presentation and during the question and answer section. Attendees and the chat function are muted, but please submit any questions via the question and answer icon at the bottom of your screen. Our ACES AWARE team is standing by to respond to you directly, and we'll also be sharing resources in the chat during the session. Finally, you will find a link to today's slide deck in the chat in case you'd like to follow along. If you run into any technical difficulties or get connect disconnected, we'll be posting the recording and the transcripts later this afternoon at acesaware.org. Now let's get started. I always like to start off with a reminder of our mission at ACES AWARE. Our mission is to change and save lives by helping clinical team members understand the importance of screening for adverse childhood experiences and by training clinical team members to respond with evidence-based interventions and trauma-informed care that will mitigate the health impacts of toxic stress. As a reminder, this webinar is eligible for continuing medical education and maintenance of certification credit. So please be sure to share the information with colleagues that may be interested, but unable to join us today. I am pleased now to introduce our accomplished presenter, Mr. Al Race. Al serves as the Deputy Director and Chief Knowledge Officer at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. His focus is on how to use the knowledge generated by the Center's work both internally and externally, to transform the landscape in which science-based intervention for children and families can thrive and grow. Al provides thought leadership for the Center's knowledge translation, communication, and public engagement portfolios, and he leads the development of the strategic communications plans for the Center's initiatives, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child, and Frontiers of Innovation. For the past 15 years, Al has worked closely with Dr. Jack Shonkoff, director of the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, and one of the preeminent researchers in the field of childhood adversity and toxic stress. We're very grateful that Al has agreed to join us for what I know will be a very informative session. Today, Al will discuss the importance of addressing childhood adversity and its impact on long-term health outcomes based on the exec their extensive research in this area. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Al Race. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks all to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to um, focus on the science of early childhood development with me today. Um, let me start with a confession. It may have been clear from Jennifer's introduction, but I am not a scientist. Um, so now that I've destroyed my credibility right from the start, um, I'll add that for the past 15 years, as she said, I have worked with Dr. Shankoff and some of the leading neuroscientists and developmental psychologists and other researchers to figure out how to translate what they know into information that the rest of us can actually use. So what I'm going to share with you today is the culmination of that work, some core concepts that I hope will be actionable in your practice. I'm going to start with a simple idea. and I know it's the same idea that grounds the ACEs AWARE initiative that advances in science are actually revealing the underlying causes of disparities in learning behavior and particularly in health. Um, and that understanding that science can help us create lasting solutions for children and families. We've known for a long time that there are these huge disparities in outcomes um, for kids as they grow, um, mostly along the lines of social economic status. And those disparities result in some kids having longer and more successful and more healthy lives, and other kids being at much greater risk of school failure, risky behaviors, illness, and, and even early death. And we've believed that, um, uh, that some combination of parents and genes 
and positive experiences and negative experiences all shape how those outcomes uh, are, are achieved, but we don't know why it's happening. Um, over, over the years, a lot of theories have been put forward, and ACEs uh, is one of those, and social determinants, and schools, and peers, even personal choices have been put forward as the reason for this. Um, many of these are based on um, important social epidemiological data, or well-founded hypotheses, and some less so. But they still don't explain why. They don't explain the causal mechanisms that could help us think about solutions. Well, science is helping us to see that these factors do, in fact, affect child development and um, outcomes. Not only that, but they interact with each other. Um, they shape each other. Even genes are influenced by the experiences we have. And in fact, science is now helping us understand how these interactions work at the molecular level. Let me give you one example. This is from the uh, rapidly growing field of epigenetics, which explains in a simplified way how experiences actually get inside the body, into the cells, and, and actually shape the expression of our genes. So here's how it works. This is a neuron, a brain cell. External experiences trigger signals to be sent between neurons. Those release gene regulatory proteins that are sent down the dendrites into the nucleus of the uh, neuron. That's where the DNA is. Those proteins attach themselves to the outside of the genes in a particular unique signature. And that signature authorizes whether, how, and when the instructions contained within each gene are expressed. So this is beginning to explain why even identical twins have different outcomes and behaviors. It's because their experiences are not identical, and that shapes how their genes are expressed. So we've known for a long time about um, how early experiences affect brain development, and this is a story that has um, shaped policy and practice around the world. The general ideas of brain architecture being formed uh, uh, through interaction with adults, um, starting at birth, if not prenatally, building on what came before, um, with the foundation uh, being either strong or weak for everything that comes later. The importance of serve and return interaction or contingent reciprocity, as the scientists say, the inter back and forth interaction between adults and children actually causes those neural connections to form. And those connections are within regions and across regions of the brain, which comprises that brain architecture. And the effects of excessive stress activation, particularly when there are no supportive adults to um, calm the stress response, can be uh, uh, harmful to the formation of those circuits uh, particularly in, reason, in er, regions of the brain that are dedicated to higher level skills. But the brain does not develop by itself. So it's time to connect that story to what's happening in the rest of the body. And this spring, this past spring, uh, we released this working paper with the number 15 on it there that's um, on this topic along with several briefs and there's gonna be a video coming out soon. We think this is a very important body of, of knowledge um, because the science tells us that uh, the very same things that support sturdy brain architecture also support the foundations of lifelong health. And it's time to bring learning and health together. So let me show you what I mean. Um, so the brain is connected to all the other systems in the body and all of these systems interact throughout the developmental period in response to experiences in the child envi child's environment. Those can be positive experiences or they can be negative experiences. I'm gonna use a scary or threatening experience as an example. So when the brain perceives a threat or some other kind of stressor in the environment, that triggers the stress response. That's important, it's necessary for survival. And it sets in motion a cascade of responses by other organ systems. So the brain triggers that response and manages it the heart and cardiovascular system pump blood and oxygen through the, through the veins. The gut and metabolic system turn food into energy. 
The neuroendocrine system maintains the delicate hormonal balance that we need, and the immune system um, springs into action to defend against infection and potentially heal injury. So the, the body is like a team of highly skilled athletes jumping into action, reading each other, responding to each other, all with a common goal. And in this case, the goal is protecting the body from whatever may be perceived as a threat. But all of these biological responses were designed to deal with short-term threats. They were not designed to stay on chronically. And when they do, there's a wear and tear effect. Sometimes we think about it like a car engine, a, a car racing its engine. So that, that's necessary to pass a truck on the highway. You need to be able to rev that engine. But if your car is sitting in the driveway and you're revving the engine for hours or days or weeks or months on end, that's going to eventually break the engine down. And it's a similar, uh, a similar phenomenon inside the body when all of these systems are activated at high levels of stress. And this explains why it is that early adversity is related to the increased risk of all of these different conditions, asthma, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, depression, autoimmune disorders, even dementia, many other conditions. And that's why it's so important to support families with young children because it's, about as much, it's as much about building a strong foundation for lifelong health as it is about early learning and social emotional development or school readiness. And several of these chronic diseases that have their roots in early childhood adversity, particularly in inflammation, which seems to be a common thread, um, are also budget busters for healthcare. In fact, three of the five most costly adult diseases are associated with early life adversity. Cardiovascular conditions, diabetes, and depression are three of the top five, and together they cost the U.S. healthcare system more than $600 billion annually. So this matters because if we can reduce hardships and adverse experiences faced by families and, and pregnant women, that it's a promising pathway to enormous potential savings in healthcare costs. But I want to be clear that not all stress is bad. That's why our National Scientific Council on the Development Child created kind of three levels of stress to explain the complexity of how stress works. Learning how to cope with stress is an important part of a child's healthy development, whether it's the stress of meeting new people or learning to walk or dealing with problems. When stress occurs to a young child within an environment of supportive relationships with adults, these physiological effects are buffered and brought back down to baseline. And the result is a healthy stress response system. That's what we call positive stress. Tolerable stress is when the stress has become more serious, um, but they are still buffered by supportive relationships. It's only when uh, the stress response is activated for a long period of time at a severe level in the absence of protective relationships that it becomes what we call toxic to developing brains and as we saw a minute ago to the rest of the body as well. So how does this fit into the concept of ACEs? Many of you are familiar with this concept of ACEs and, and the community and systemic adversity that is a part of the ACEs AWARE initiative and how these are linked correlationally to poor life outcomes. We know there's a connection. We just don't know why. Toxic stress helps us explain why. Um, because these kinds of adversities trigger that toxic stress response, and the toxic stress response has that effect on all of those different organ systems, that's what contributes to all of these poor life outcomes. Trauma has a lot of different definitions, and I, I'm not an expert on them, and I won't get into them in depth here, but we think of it more as sort of the psychological manifestation of experiencing those events and experiencing the events that cause toxic stress. Now, how do we respond to all this? There's a whole spectrum of possible ways in which we could respond, um, starting at the source, reducing those sources of stress, and doing the kinds of work that's happening across the state in California with ACEs screenings and referrals. At the more extreme end, 
of people who have really experienced toxic stress and trauma um, that the need for trauma-informed care and, and intensive therapeutic in interventions is, is clear. But you can see there's a gap here, and that's the gap of actually being able to treat the biological effects of stress, where the science is still in its early stages, even being to measure in individuals the effects of excessive stress, stress activation is in its very early days in terms of research. So that's a gap that I, th I think the research world is trying to fill right now. But even right now, there's still plenty we can do in terms of all those other um, areas on that spectrum of response. Now, ha having measures for individuals is important because science is just screaming at us right now that everyone is different. So understanding heterogeneity or variation in sensitivity to context um, is critical to rethinking how we address those social determinants or those adverse childhood experiences um, in individuals uh, rather than as a, as a population-wide response. So I'm using these charts to make a point. They're from a study by Kim Noble and colleagues that showed a consistent relationship between a range of developing developmental measures and socioeconomic status. The higher the SES, the better the outcomes. There's really nothing new there. We've known that for decades. But when you reveal the actual data behind these trend lines, what you see is a huge amount of variation. Some individuals with low SES do extremely well. Some with high SES do poorly. So simply improving SES will improve the trend lines, but it will not necessarily improve outcomes for every child. And the same is true for the kinds of trend lines we see with ACEs. Now, another point that I want to stress it comes from work we've done with pediatricians in our innovation network on how to actually communicate about ACEs and stress with families that are going through it. So we developed the concept of toxic stress more than 15 years ago to communicate a complex biology of adversity in a way that conveys a sense of urgency to policymakers. But it had unintended consequences that are very relevant for pediatricians who are working every day with families because it can make people who are experiencing toxic stress feel like they are damaged goods beyond repair. So it's important to avoid that. So if you're talking with your patients about all this, for example, I'm gonna give you a few tips that we learned from doing research on how to better communicate this concept. So the first tip is it's really important to combine any discussion um, about the effects of stress with messages, messages about the possibilities of resilience, um, that problems are not inevitable, that there are solutions. So we, don't, we make sure we don't say toxic stress will cause something, but we say that it can cause something. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge how hard it is to be a responsive caregiver under stressful conditions, how, how badly it feels to have too much stress. So this metaphor of being an overloaded truck is a good example of kind of empathizing with how, how bad it feels when you're so overloaded by stress. And, the, and then getting to solutions um, is about how we unload the burdens from that overloaded truck. Um, so that can be a useful metaphor when you're talking about it, but whether or not you use that metaphor, it's so important to combine the, idea, um, the ideas of resilience and hope and solutions with any discussion of ACEs and toxic stress. And to emphasize the need for responsive caregiving with children, but it also recognized the ex that external factors can make it very difficult to do so. Um, and finally, to balance the need for systemic solutions with self-efficacy. So in other words, to help people feel empowered that they can do something about this, but also recognize the need for systemic solutions to help reduce those burdens. Here's why that balance is so important. We also tested social determinants, uh, a social determinants argument um, for why paying attention to early adversity was important. And this um, uh, blurb on the left here uh, is, is um, what we showed respondents in the research. So living in a community with high rates of violence creates constant stress, et cetera. 
Um, in order for doctors and communities to create services that address the root causes of stress, we need to know more about how environments cause stress and affect children's health and development. This is sort of the classic social determinants argument. But what we found in our research was but that using this argument and this description um, reduced people's hope and, and sense of self-efficacy. And here's a quote from the research that it leaves people less able to see how positive development and health can be achieved following exposure to early adversity. Resilience is another topic that's very challenging to talk about. So I'm going to demonstrate how we do about how we do talk about it without making people feel like resilience is some trait that's inborn, like grit that you either have or you don't have. It's really important for people to understand that um, resilience can actually be strengthened by supportive relationships and skill building. Um, so the ability to thrive despite dealing with difficult circumstances is not a trait you're born with. It can be built over time with the right influences. It's the result of multiple interactions between the genes we're born with and the experiences we have. That's why every child is different in how they respond to adversity and how they respond to intervention. We think of it as kind of like a scale, like you see here, where negative experiences, and we all have negative experiences in life, tip the scale toward bad outcomes but positive experiences tip it toward good outcomes. And that can help us think about the kinds of things that could tip any person's scale to the positive. So things like responsive relationships and a sense of mastery, some supportive community services, and faith and cultural traditions also are uh, known as uh, resilience factors. These things can tip the scale toward positive outcomes. So the more things that we can pile on that positive side, the better. But it's not just about experiences. Every scale has a fulcrum, and where that fulcrum is placed can make it harder or easier to tip the scale to the positive or to the negative. We think of the fulcrum as sort of our pre genetic predispositions, which we now know can also be influenced by experiences, even prenatally. And we can move that fulcrum which is the important thing to know here, that it's not fixed. It's, it's, it has a particular set point at birth, but over time we can move that fulcrum by strengthening the adaptive toolkit of skills that people have um, to help them plan and make goals, uh, meet those goals, uh, move to plan B when plan A doesn't work out, and adjust to any kind of challenging situation. We can think of them as executive function and self-regulation skills. Um, but we can also address the structural conditions that make it harder for some people to thrive. And I think this year has been a particularly uh, obvious year for all the kinds of stressors that people are experiencing because there sure has been a pileup over the past year. Whether it's economic insecurity or a, a loved one dealing with COVID or your childcare closed, you can't visit your family and your friends, and, and uh, major structural problems like racial injustice um, are all stressors piling on that negative side. And some of us are more affected than others. So the degree to which we can address some of those um, larger causes of these stresses through policies and programs and community services, um, the better. Because if you look at this scale, which is now tipped, tipped toward the negative, it's important to recognize there are three ways we can tip that scale back toward the positive. One is to remove negative things from the negative side. The other is to pile on positive things to the positive side. And the third is to shift that fulcrum through responsive relationships and active skill building to give people um, the ability to strengthen their skills that enable them to adjust, adapt, and cope. So I've covered a lot in a short amount of time. I'm going to try to sum that all up with three core principles from all of that complex science. Three principles you can take home and use. We call them design principles. Um, that's a term that comes from the tech world where design principles are kind of like your North Star. If you keep coming back to these design principles and say, are we doing these things? 
How are we doing toward these things? Can we do better to, the, to address these things? That you will be able to design your programs and your services um, in a way that are more in alignment with what the science says uh, children and families need to thrive. So these three things should have come clear through the, the earlier parts of this presentation. Building responsive relationships, reducing sources of stress, and strengthening those core skills that we think of as executive function and self-regulation, the planning and goal setting and adaptation and uh, memory skills of executive function. So um, these principles apply not just to children, but also to adults. So adults need relationships in their lives. They're a way of, of, of reducing stress and finding solutions to problems. Adults need those skills to provide the stable uh, household that children need to thrive in. And everyone needs less stress in their lives, but particularly if you're experiencing significant adversity. And they all interact with each other as well. So if we have responsive relationships, that's a potent way of reducing the, um, the effects of stress. And uh, it opens up bandwidth to work on those core skills. And having those core skills can also create stable environments which reduces sources of stress. So you can see they all work together. And um, if we can provide these things for children and uh, adult caregivers, then the children will uh, develop in a healthy way and be more prepared for school. And adults will be able to provide responsive caregiving to children, as well as econ uh, economic stability for the household. So what does that look like? So these are three principles you can keep coming back to and say, um, are we doing our work in a way that aligns with these principles? But what would that actually look like in a pediatric practice? So I'm gonna share a few ideas that have come from our work with pediatricians, but they're just a start. I'm sure you can think of many, many other ways. And, and many of the things you're already doing probably fit these categories. But what's most helpful is to take a critical eye to ways in which you could do better. Look for ways, areas in which your practice is actually not supporting these principles as strongly as, they, as you could. That's the space for innovation. So here are just a few ideas. For responsive relationships, actually coaching parents and caregivers on how to do serve and return interaction. We have resources on our website and there are others that, that help, um, can help parents understand the simple steps that they can take to engage in that kind of back and forth. Um, providing ideas for fun activities that parents and children can do together that support the establishment and maintenance of those um, responsive relationships. Um, those core skills can be developed through games and play-based activities that help children practice those skills at different ages. Um, uh, also, just helping families establish regular routines is an important part of building those kind of planning and goal-setting type skills. Reducing sources of stress. One very um, uh, potent way to do that is to help connect families to um, ways in which they can uh, reduce the stresses in their lives, like uh, receiving services that help them meet basic needs. And even just identifying those sources of stress and thinking about what solutions might be um, is a way that pediatricians can help. Um, so that's just a starting point, um, but hopefully this sort of triggers new ideas in your own practice for how you might um, apply these, these principles. I'm going to close with one more um, core idea that is in um, our most recent working paper and has come from um, the research on, uh, on health in particular. And that's that experiences during the prenatal period and the first two or three years after birth may actually affect adult health even more than school achievement. So if you, this is in, just in case you need any more justification for why your work with infants and toddlers is important and why it should be better connected with OBGYN, this is an important headline because that means that services for three and four-year-olds are important um, but are not early enough to have the greatest impact. And that's particularly true with health. So 
if we want to improve long, lifelong health outcomes, it's just as important to reduce stress for pregnant mothers and families with infants and toddlers as it is to encourage better lifestyle choices in adulthood. And yet most of the um, medical advice relating to a lot of these chronic health conditions focuses on changing behaviors in adulthood, whereas we should be looking much earlier and trying to reduce adversity and stress early in life. And um, there are lots of studies that, are, um, ex that, that support this finding um, and, and they are in our paper, so I, I won't go into them right now, and if you want to dig deeper, I would encourage you to go to our website um, because there's a lot more um, science there, including a guide to age-appropriate ways of supporting executive function skills, our working paper, and all the other resources that are connected to that working paper. And I'll also add, you'll see here in red here is a, an extended uh, URL for our website. We've just created a new area of our site um, where we've gathered materials that we think would be of special interest to those of you in pediatrics. Um, so I encourage you to go take a look there and, and take advantage of those resources. And with that, I thank you for your time. I thank you for the opportunity to share this science and I welcome uh, questions. Thanks so much, Al, for that very informative presentation. It was so helpful to hear about your research and how it underpins so much of the work that we're doing with ACEs Aware. I have a few questions that I'd like to pose to you that will dig in on a couple of the topics you covered today. First, can you talk a little more about the origins of toxic stress? Does it result from certain types or sources of stress? Yeah, great question. Um, so, Toxic stress is really defined by um, the severity of the stressor, the duration of the stressor, the timing in development when it happens, um, and the availability of supportive relationships or lack thereof. Um, these all interact with and combine with genetic predispositions. So it's really about the interaction of all of those factors more than it is any one particular um, source of stress. The, the body um, doesn't necessarily differentiate between different kinds of stressors, only that um, something appears to be a threat um, and that um, that, that uh, triggers that stress response. So it, the, you know, certainly um, there are some stressors that, that are so severe, experiencing um, extreme violence, for example, um, where they're likely to affect um, anyone adversely. Um, but even there, individuals uh, are affected differently because of the, the interconnection of all those different factors. So, you know, brief experience um, with the availability of a, of a supportive relationship and a genetic predisposition to um, perhaps uh, 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 lower levels of anxiety might um, lead you to be less affected by that extreme experience, whereas another child might be much more um, uh, uh, affected by it. Um, you know, anxiety is a good example. So there are sort of genetic predispositions to anxiety. And a child who is in anxiety-provoking um, situations with that predisposition is going to be more affected than a child that doesn't have that predisposition in the same situation. And the length of time they're exposed to that situation and the degree of support that they have all factor into the actual effect. That's why we think of toxic stress really as a toxic stress response. It's the body's response to a stressful event or stress provoking event. Um, and so how the body responds, it depends on all of those different factors. Al, we know that having supportive relationships with parents and other caregivers is critical to building resilience. What are some of the other buffering supports that can help children manage the physiological effects of stress? Yeah, so there, there's a, um, a, a large body of research about um, protective factors and uh, resilience factors. Um, and I'm not an expert on, on that full scope of research, um, but, but it is out there. I mean, but I can say that um, there's a lot of evidence um, that supports in the community um, and um, supports in the family can, can help. So supporting families is a way of supporting 
uh, resilience in children. Um, so, you know, in addition to those responsive relationships with caregivers, and I want to emphasize that those caregivers can be inside the home, they can also be professional caregivers outside the home, providing those kind of consistent, responsive, supportive relationships. But even beyond that, um, things like, you know, access to high quality services, like, of course, health care and child care, um, access to nutritious foods, uh, green spaces, recreation play, uh, facilities, um, being part of a supportive community, like a faith community or um, uh, any kind of uh, community that's supportive of each other. Um, those are all things that we can do as, as communities at a, at a, at a policy level and, and as a at a community level to um, help support resilience. And then the other, as I was describing, is, is uh, helping uh, individuals um, to develop and strengthen their executive function and self-regulation skills. Um, so uh, those are the, the school, the skills that can help um, children and adults adapt to challenging situations, to create solutions, to find plan B when plan A, plan A doesn't work out, plan C even, um, and keep adjusting and adapting and um, having a, a long range view, remembering what your goal is and, um, and delaying gratification until you achieve that goal. All of these things are part of that constellation of skills we think of as executive function and self-regulation. And they can be built over time through practice and scaffolding. So by giving people opportunities to practice those skills at, an, at a developmentally appropriate level um, for meaningful goals, goals that are meaningful to them at their stage of development, we can develop those skills starting in infancy, but all the way up through um, early adulthood, because that's the part of the brain that is, has, takes the longest to develop. It involves the interconnection of circuits between multiple different regions of the brain. And so each region has to mature, and then those connections between regions have to mature, which is why anybody who has a teenager at home knows that they're not fully developed in terms of their executive function skills uh, at age 16 or 17. Um, and that's why we can help. There's still an opportunity to help build those skills, even with young parents who may not have had that kind of opportunity uh, when they were developing. Thanks, Al. That was super interesting and, and new information to many of us. Um, can you also maybe provide a few examples of the games or activities that help children build executive function and self-regulation skills? Sure. Um, thanks. I mentioned that at uh, the end of my presentation that we have a guide on our website um, to uh, developmentally appropriate uh, activities that caregivers can engage in with children at different ages. So starting in infancy when, um, you know, babies are able to do things like lap games, peekaboo, that kind of thing, um, and games where you hide something under a blanket and they try to recognize that the object hasn't disappeared forever, that, that maybe it'll, it'll pop up again. They try to find it. Um, imitation games, making faces with each other, those kinds of things. Those are, those are actually laying the foundation for these skills. And then there's a tremendous uh, spurt of development in these skills in the, in the toddler years, in the preschool years. Um, so toddlers are, are ready for more active games. Um, things that uh, require more inhibitory control, things like um, freeze dance, where you're doing a dance and then everybody has to freeze, um, or remembering that certain gestures go with uh, a song, Eatsy Weetsy Spider, right? Um, and sorting games and, and imaginary play, those kinds of things. And then by the time you get to the preschool years, you can sort of ratchet up the complexity of them and the amount of memory that's required. You can do things like, you know, Simon Says. Children can tell stories themselves. They can in engage in active role-playing games where they, they take on somebody else's role, which kind of forces them to understand another person's perspective and to inhibit their own um, uh, impulsive behaviors in order to be a part of that role and to remember the rules of the game. All of these things are foundational for executive function self-regulation. 
And then when you get into like elementary school, they're ready for card games, board games, things that require memory and strategy and um, physical games that require attention, even, um, you know, independent activities like those I spy books where you have to really focus and pay attention and look for things in, in, in a picture. Um, and, and then by adolescence, um, there are two factors that come into play. One, besides the increasing complexity that they're ready for, one is the increasing importance of peers, and um, the other is the increasing importance of meaningful external goals. So in other words, attaching your scaffolding of these skills to goals that um, are important to the teenager is a really important piece of this. So in other words, it might be getting a driver's license. Well, mapping out a process that can get help them work toward getting that driver's license that they want so badly and achieve some short-term goals along the way can help them understand that there is a process for achieving long-term goals. Um, and there, it, but it, the fun doesn't have to stop either, right? So, you know, sports and music and theater and strategy games, anything that causes people to take on different roles and inhibit their behavior and remember what they're trying to do, remember um, different steps of a process, those are all scaffolding of these skills. And Al, are there tools available to help adults and other caregivers support children in building these skills? That's a great question. We've, um, uh, you know, our center is focused on early childhood, so that's not, it's not a core area of expertise, but I will say we have worked with um, organizations that do a lot of work with adults, particularly around um, economic self-sufficiency. And one of the things that we learned together was they were actually building these executive function and self-regulation skills with their clients, but didn't have that same terminology that we've been applying in early childhood. And so one of, some of the things we've learned from them are things like you know, simple um, uh, uh, framing documents or, or um, uh, uh, outlines of a process, or checklists, um, simple text reminders of appointments, um, just just easy ways to kind of scaffold the use of those skills because the the adults um, again it needs to be in a context of a meaningful goal so in this case it might it might be economic self sufficiency but in for pediatricians it might be supporting their children or something along those lines and so um, giving them some way to um, keep track of the things that need to be done and to follow um, a process toward achieving those goals and to take a step back when they need to, take a deep breath, uh, uh, reduce the stress, and um, think about possible solutions to a problem that's come up. Those are, those are all kinds of strategies that you can use. But remember that um, it's also quite likely that that uh, young parents who have experienced a lot of adversity in their lives have probably developed very sophisticated survival skills in order to get where they are now. And we should be building on those skills and not just starting saying, oh, you have a deficit of this or that. We should be saying, oh, you're really, really good at um, making decisions on the fly, right? Um, because you've had to all your life make really quick decisions. Um, so how can we use that and say, all right, we're going to add on to that and think about, um, how can, how can we introduce a little more planfulness to that decision making? Um, how can we give you some tools that you can use to pause and reflect and then make a decision about what you're going to do? Um, so those kinds of scaffolding tools, I think are, are, are what we've seen have been helpful. So as I've learned in my work on this initiative, a lot of people sometimes confuse ACEs with the social determinants of health. Are ACEs considered social determinants of health? Why or why not? Um, well, I, you know, the, the, as, as you well know, the, the, um, the story of ACEs started with um, a study of 10 particular adverse childhood experiences that were inside the family. Um, those would not be considered social determinants. Social determinants are more related to your zip code. 
They're more related to the things that happen outside the home that affect your life, that affect your health. Um, so things like um, uh, crime rates and violence in the community and um, green space and pollutants, um, noise pollution, all those kinds of things have been shown to have effects on development. Um, but they wouldn't be considered ACEs in the traditional initial study. Now, ACEs Aware has expanded that definition um, among other groups, which is very a very positive development because it begins to take into consideration some of those things that are taking place outside the family that have um, an effect on, on development. So even things like uh, racism and discrimination um, and uh, um, you know, as I mentioned before, um, environmental uh, um, problems that are very often kind of um, racialized in terms of um, neighborhoods of color tending to have been exposed to more pollutants because of zoning regulations and environmental regulations that go back decades. Um, so it's a very complex mix of factors that contribute to these social determinants. Um, and I guess one other important thing to, to sort of tease out here is, is that um, adversity and stress are not the same thing either, right? Um, so there are forms of adversity. Think about lead in the water is a form of adversity that doesn't cause stress, but it certainly harms development. Um, and so we have to take into consideration all of those factors, whether they're environmental or social determinants or um, uh, uh, policy factors, deeply embedded structural racism. Um, all of these things combine with what's going on inside the home to have an effect on development. And, and it's important to recognize also that what's going on inside the home can be a buffer against all of those things that are going on outside the home. At this, in the same way that services outside the home can be a buffer for things that are going bad inside the home. And that wraps up our Q&A. Thank you to our audience members who submitted questions, and of course to Al Race from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child for sharing his time and expertise. As we start to wrap up today, I wanna to encourage all of you to take the free Becoming ACEs Aware in California training that covers the science of ACEs and toxic stress in a clinical manner how to screen for ACEs, and how to implement trauma-informed care. Medi-Cal providers are reminded that you should submit an attestation form after completing the training so that you can get certified to receive payment for conducting ACE screenings. And also, don't forget to sign up to be part of the ACEs Aware Clinical Directory. More information and links to our training site, the attestation form, and the clinical directory can all be found on our acesaware.org website. We will continue using your feedback to inform and plan future webinars. So please do complete the webinar evaluation that you'll receive later today in your email inbox. A recording of this webinar will also be available and emailed to all attendees and posted on the website later today. Please do share it with any colleagues or others in your network who may be interested. Thanks again for joining us today.